Years ago, I planned out the backstory for Fear Herself, my demon-creating villain in Multiverse Tales, and then I proceeded to never tell anyone what that backstory was, but I finally have a framing for it that I like for today's episode. Through an interaction between her and one of the more recent villains of Multiverse Tales, the Archon Demon Psycho Paradelict. This episode is also not going to have my usual three or four drawings that an episode would have, because I took a few days off recently and during that time kind of realized there's a bunch of stories I've been wanting to tell on this channel over the last few years that I just haven't because I haven't had an idea for three or four drawings that would fit with the episode. So I'm going to be doing some experimenting where I'm not sticking as much to that formula. Because this is an episode where I do like the art in it, but I care a lot more about the story. So I hope you all enjoy and let's get into Fear Isn't Enough. Let's go. Hit like if you want, subscribe if you feel like, but either way, enjoy the show. Previously on Multiverse Tales, the being known as Fear herself, or to the few who know her original name, Arava, is the overseer of Dimension D-667. She was meant to protect this realm and its people as its overseer, but instead she has created hundreds if not thousands of demons who prey on people with specific fears and phobias. These people either overcome their fears and escape the demons, or are slaughtered by them. But now she has taken things a massive leap further and awakened the seven Archon Demons, beings of creation and deception who can make whole armies of new demons in moments. They are on a tear of the multiverse, invading dimensions and subjecting them to the torment of their creations. Which is what Fear thought she had wanted. But our story today begins with Fear watching a world fall in a way that doesn't align with the goals and values she claims to have. Fear stood with her entire body clenched in rage as she watched more and more distant explosions pepper the earth below. She was on a moon that circled what had once been a technologically advanced and thriving world that became more and more uninhabitable with every nuclear eruption. Didn't expect to see you here, but I get it. It's always nice to sit back and watch a fireworks display, eh, kiddo? Fear's head lurched to the side to see the four-armed, TV-headed demon, Psycho Paradelict, grinning down upon his work. With her lip trembling in fury, Fear spun the overseer runes on her forearm, then slammed her palm to the ground. Flaky and slimy black tendrils burst up from the moon's surface, grabbing each of the Archon's arms and one wrapping around his neck. She hovered up in front of his face and grabbed the sides of his head. This is not what you're supposed to be doing. You have to give people a chance to change, and only kill them if they don't. Completely unfazed by the binds on his arms and neck, the Archon said, But I did give this world a chance. My demons made it clear that they were in this world, and that they could take over the forms of the people they killed. These folks knew that an invasion had taken place, but instead of using their vast technology to discover a way to figure out who was a demon and who wasn't, they simply became more and more suspicious about which country had made the demons, until their paranoia brought them to... this he said, gesturing down to the eruption-rocked world. Fear squeezed her hands harder, cracking the sides of Psycho's TV head. That's not giving people a chance. There are billions of people on that world who are all going to die without having any shot at overcoming their fears and living on without them. Well, I suppose, but I've treated the world as a collective unit, and as a collective, they failed to learn and grow, so poof. And really, doing things this way just seems much more efficient, don't you think? Her hands crushed farther into his head, sending sparks flying out around him, though the Archon was still unfazed. Don't make me send you back to where you came from, demon. Oh, by all means, kiddo, go right on ahead. Hit me with everything you've got. Let's see if you even leave a scratch. As he finished the line, his head healed back out, pushing her hands away and the glass of his TV screen face cracked open and became like jagged teeth, with a sparking tongue lashing out between them and grazing across Fear's face. She floated back as the Archon pulled his arms free with next to no effort, and taking the tendril off of his neck as if pulling off a loose tie. I'm truly curious, what was your contingency plan if we didn't do what you wanted? You didn't even take the powers of the Reaper for yourself, despite the fact that those gifts are the only real threat to us. You've been quite ignorantly trusting of demons of deception, kiddo. Honestly, did you even think this through at all? 
Fear slammed both palms down onto the ground and two draconic demon heads burst up on either side of the Archon. They breathed green and purple flames at it. Psycho simply swirled his hands around in a circle though, and all the flames spun and shrunk until they became a fist-sized fire floating over his palm. I actually have a little theory I've been wanting to investigate in regards to your intentions. He blew on the flame and it went out. But to find out if I'm correct, we'll need to have a little poke around in your past. In a blink, the Archon was in front of Fear. He grabbed her arms with two of his own and held them aside, then with his other two, he grabbed her head. Let's take a little trip together, you and I. Before she could respond, they were both suddenly in a black void, standing next to each other. Fear pressed a hand onto her shoulder, intending to make another tendril burst from her arm, but nothing happened. Let's see, you've been an overseer of your world for 700 years or so? Ah, yes, I'm feeling some very strong emotionally charged pulls from right around that time period. Let's see where these strands lead. Water suddenly appeared beneath them, and an island rushed up to meet the two. An island that fear didn't want to remember. They stood on the beach, and Psycho waved his hand. The island spun beneath them, and then he pulled forward in, and they slid right into a village, then into a hut where a little girl was sleeping. Stop it! Let me out of here, you have no right to be digging around in my- Oh, hush, hush, hush! Something good is coming, I can feel it! An exhausted-looking Polynesian woman marched into the hut and grabbed the arm of the sleeping girl. Speaking in a language fear hadn't used in centuries, the woman said, Arava, get up now! She pulled the girl to her feet as she was still coming into consciousness. What have I told you about being the first to start village chores, hmm? Get out there and be of value to me and value to your people. She pushed the girl out of the hut and off to work, alongside other villagers who all seemed much more relaxed and pleasant than this woman. Very interesting indeed, and quite in line with what I'd suspected. It's rare for someone to grow up looking to torment millions of people without having a parent that did a real number on your self-worth. He said, gesturing at fear. Let me out of here now, or I will tear every finger and toe and limb off of your body. As she spoke, all of his arms and fingers suddenly popped off out of place and hovered around him. There, did it for you. Now quiet down, we're jumping ahead to some more good stuff. Lights all around them flashed as the sun rose and set a few dozen times, and the ground moved under them until they were on the shoreline at sunset, standing next to a dizzy-looking disheveled man slumped into the sand. He was holding a large glass vial, half full of a strong-smelling alcohol. He looked to be of the same ethnicity as Arava, but was clad in formal, yet bloodied English robes from the time period. A young Arava wandered up towards him as the man sat alone on the beach, twirling overseer runes on his arm. He was muttering something to himself that she couldn't quite make out. I can't do this anymore. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. He glanced back in surprise as a young Arava came up and said, I Excuse me, do you need help? Are you okay? For the moment, Fear had stopped protesting this little journey through her past, and couldn't help but stare at her young self approaching this man. The dizzy man just drunkenly leered at the kid for a moment, then looked at the runes on his arm once more. He took one last swig from his booze, then tossed the bottle into the swaying water. He stood up, twirling and pressing the runes in an intricate pattern as he wobbled towards Arava. He nearly fell over, and she ran up to try and steady him. Oh, look at you, trying to be of value, just like Mommy Dearest wanted. Gotta say, I kinda wanna know what this guy's story is, but I don't get the sense that I could pull that from your memories alone. Young Arava was trying to ask the man what was wrong, and what the lights on his arms were, but he was ignoring all the questions, still spinning the runes. Finally, they all gathered up into one bright red light that floated up to sit in his palm. He looked down at Arava with tears in his eyes and just said, Don't try and help them. They don't deserve it. He then pressed his palm into the spot right between Arava's eyes. There was a blinding burst of light, and when it cleared, the man was just stumbling off into the ocean. Arava was laying unconscious in the sand, with his overseer runes now slowly spinning, on her arm. Well, well, becoming an overseer at, what, seven years old? And with the only man who could have taught you what those gifts meant seemingly having gone out to literally sleep with the fishes. 
The pieces of you are all falling into place. I can feel a time of great tension approaching, but let's jump ahead to the next big emotional marker, shall we? Just let me go. I don't need to see this all again. Oh, but my dear, self-reflection is good for you. Or, in the very least, forcing others to do self-reflection is entertaining for me. He waved his hand and time sped forward, but Fear could feel all the emotions through that time. Her people being scared of her new marks, her mother being deeply embarrassed of all the attention she was drawing, and forcing her to work even harder to be of more value, all while young Arava was trying to learn what these marks meant and what they could do. Finally, they found themselves at a night when a massive storm was tearing through the village. Everyone had gathered in a main hut at the center of the island. Arava's mother was pushing her to work on holding up the walls to keep the rain out, while others were encouraging her to let Arava huddle with the other children in the center of the building. Fear and Psychoperdelict glanced over to the other kids and noticed one young girl crying and cowering more profusely than the others, with every crack of lightning making her trying to huddle farther and farther into herself. Despite all the centuries, Arava still remembered the girl clearly. Kaipo. Ah, that one's important, is she? I can feel it, she'll play a part in this later, hmm? Fear ignored him and looked back at her younger self. Young Arava was distracted from holding up the walls, noticing a feeling from her runes. Finally, unable to ignore it, she started tapping and spinning them intuitively. Her mother noticed and stomped towards her angrily, but then Arava raised her hand above her head and spun it. As she did, the rain and torrential winds slowed. She did it again, and the clouds began to clear. Soon, the chief walked cautiously outside and looked up, before gesturing for everyone to come outside too. Arava and her mother came out as well, as everyone was cheering praises to the sky. The storm was gone, thanks to Arava and her runes. Her mother was amazed and suddenly knelt down next to her daughter. She wrapped her hands around Arava's runes with a smile bigger than Arava had ever seen from her, and said, this is it. This is how you be of value to our people. Young Arava smiled widely, with a rare feeling of pride from her mother's approval. But looking back on this moment, seeing that smile just made Fear's heart shatter all over again. She hovered over to her mother and tried to grab her arm away from her young self, but Fear's current body just phased through the memory. She tried again and again, to no avail. Oh my dear, there's no changing the past now. What's done is done is done. Psycho scrubbed forward in time again, and all the events they jumped past still flashed through Fear and Psycho's minds. Fear had spent the next few years learning to control the weather, even the tides, and to help the soils flourish. Their island went through the greatest period of prosperity it ever had. But it still wasn't enough for Arava's mother. Even when the island had more than ever before, Arava's mother kept telling her to be of more value to her and her people. Even the villagers seemed to start getting greedy. When crop yields and the amount of fish that would come in would dip even slightly, they'd come to Arava requesting more and more, as if they were in fear that it would all go away. But beyond even her island, Arava had a sense that there was a whole world out there who needed her help. She learned how to use her runes to teleport across the planet, and found a world full of people in need, people terrified of not having enough food or water or wealth. She started doing all she could to help other villages and countries to have flourishing crops. Soon enough, Arava realized she couldn't do all this work herself, so she intuitively learned how to make servants to help her, angelic beings that didn't have her exact same powers, but could help on their own in other ways. When she'd returned to her village, though, from helping elsewhere, there always seemed to be more she needed to do, and her mother would scold her for not being there more for her own people. So then she'd spend more time on her island, but again feel drawn to go help elsewhere, going back to the places she'd helped before, and seeing that even with more food and life-supporting weather, the people of the world always wanted more. When they had abundance, they feared losing it, and would go to war with one another over the additional resources. Arava gave and gave and helped and worked, and no matter how much she did, for her people and for the world, it was never enough. The hits of happiness that Arava would get when she did something that her mother or her people liked became smaller and smaller as they were overwhelmed by the knowledge that soon enough she'd be reminded that they needed more from her. Until she finally broke.
The fast tracking finally slowed as Fear and the Archon came to a time when Arava arrived back on her island. She'd been out helping elsewhere, but now found that a light storm had begun on her home. It wasn't a particularly dangerous one, but there was thunder and lightning, and Arava could feel the fear seeping out of a village that hadn't seen a storm in years. Arava was exhausted from months of what felt like non-stop work, so she took a tired beat before fixing the storm. But before she could start, her mother found her, grabbed her arm, and said, You've embarrassed me, Arava. How could you let this happen? Fix this weather and do it now. Be of value to your village. This time, though, Arava couldn't take her mother's scolding. Arava ripped her arm free and fell back onto the sand. She didn't stand. She just crossed her legs and sat there for a moment, then looked up. Instead of seeing someone she was desperate to please, Arava now looked at her mother with fury. Still, the girl started tapping her runes. She held her hand to the sky and spun. But instead of the storm disappearing, it got bigger. The clouds darkened and lightning exploded down into the waters around them. The girl muttered, The man was right. None of you deserve my help. Still in a seated position, Arava hovered up into the air and watched as the storm rocked her village. Her mother called up through the wind and rain, but Arava couldn't even hear her. She just stared from afar as her mother was nearly blown over by the torrent. Then, well, she isn't sure if she did this herself from fury at her mother, or if it just happened by chance. A bolt of lightning fired down right onto the ungrateful woman. When the light of it cleared, in a crater of crystallized sand, her mother's lifeless body lay still. Arava was shocked to find that in that moment, she still felt nothing but anger. As the storm raged on, Arava could feel more and more fear spewing out of the village. Eventually, its stench was so thick it was like she could touch it in the air, and Arava began spinning her runes and collecting that fearful energy, blending it together into a physical form before her. As it was starting to take on a humanoid shape, an explosion of lightning struck the creation. And in that moment, for the first time, Arava had created a demon. This was a demon of storms that craved the fear of those terrified of thunder and lightning, and it took over control of the weather around the island, making the storm rage harder than calming to give a false sense of hope before bringing it back bigger and more forceful. Arava sat in the air for a full day watching her home be ravaged by the storm. Some villagers would get picked up by the winds and be tormented personally by the demon, then killed with the fiend absorbing all of their fear. That is until the girl called Kaipo was pulled up into the air. Arava assumed this girl would be devoured instantly by the demon, given how much she already feared storms. But that isn't what happened. The demon took her up into the clouds and had thunder and lightning erupting all around her. It eventually dropped her down to the shore as if giving her a chance to run, but had clouds and wind rock up around her again so she couldn't get back to shelter. The demon kept swooping past her with a ball of electricity building up in its hands, getting closer and closer. But instead of becoming more afraid, Kaipo stopped trying to run. She stood her ground and looked at the demon as it passed and yelled, Leave us alone! The demon flew right up to her face and shrieked, with a circle of lightning erupting all around her. But she just screamed again, Leave us alone! And she slapped the demon across the face. The instant she did, the clouds retracted ever so slightly. The demon just stared at her, but again she struck it, and more clouds faded. She took another step towards the demon and pushed it back. Finally, the creature just shot up into the sky in a bolt of lightning and vanished, with all of the clouds parting and revealing a sunny day over the destroyed village. Arava remained in hiding, but continued to watch over the next week as Kaipo helped lead her village in repairing things, the demon did return, drawn in by the fear that many still had of it, but Kaipo instructed the others in not fearing this being. Some could not do as instructed and were still taken into the sky and killed, but with only a few hours this time of the demon returning, enough villagers overcame their fears to ward it away once more. Kaipo, this girl that had once been petrified of storms, had overcome her fear and was now teaching others how not to fear the weathers or the demon that seemed to be controlling them. 
Ah, so I can see the pieces falling into place in your little head. Giving people abundance makes them greedy, but if you torment them, you will see that fear isn't enough to beat everyone. Some may fail and die, but those who persevere will be better and all the more resilient for it. Not needing constant handouts from someone like you. You tried this many more times and saw more successes happening. Some of your angels converted to demons to help you do this further, though some angels who'd been embodied by souls chose to try and oppose you. And so on and on your little quarrels went, until you learned of the multiverse and decided it was time to go bigger. Hence bringing us charming archons in. Do I have all of that right? Are we done now? Well, it has been certainly an illuminating little journey to see where your whole gimmick started. Much of it was very much as suspected. Still trying to be of value, just like Mommy wanted, hmm? Shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. I left her behind forever ago, and now I'm just trying to make people live better or die so they don't have to spend their lives miserable. This has nothing to do with her. Oh, my dear, it has everything to do with her. Psycho Perdelic's body glitched and everything cleared around them. But then appeared young Arava sitting on the ground crying, and next to her, her mother curled up in a ball, looking terrified. I didn't get to see the whole story of your mother, but it seemed she was constantly in fear that she wasn't enough for her village, and she projected that right onto her little girl. Even when you did more for your village than anyone ever had before, she was still scared of not being enough. And misery loves company, so she subconsciously wanted you to be as afraid as well. Achieving this by giving out fleeting praise, followed by consistent lack of love and appreciation. Oh, I love humans' ability to unknowingly torment each other. You saw her ungrateful attitude in people all around the world. No matter how much you helped, no matter how much value you gave, it was never going to be enough. So you found a way to stay in a perpetual loop of both trying to be of value to people of this world, to please a mother who is no longer around, while also torturing your mother who you saw in every victim your demons stalked. You can pretend you've just been trying to help people, but like I said, misery loves company and deep down you wanted to bring as much pain to the rest of the world as you feel inside to this day. And all the while, all your sad, desperate inner child has ever wanted to know was... He gestured down to the image of young, crying Arava. The girl was grabbing her unresponsive mother's arm. Why was I never enough for you? Why couldn't my value just be that I was your daughter? Fear knelt down next to her weeping young self and tried to hug her. But again, her hands just went through. And soon the child and her mother vanished, leaving just fear and the demon. You see, that's the deliciously cruel thing about childhood trauma, my dear. If you don't figure out what yours is and deal with it, it won't just ruin your life, but it will torture everyone around you. And if someone with so much power as yourself lives your life unknowingly acting from it... They both suddenly reappeared on the moon again, looking down on an Earth still being erupted in nuclear war. To think how many lives have been lost because one little girl didn't get enough love from her mommy. Fear knelt on the ground, shaking, smelling the stench of her own terror spilling off her. If it's any consolation, you have been of immense value to me and my band of merry demons, though now that value has worn out. And even if you wanted to change your ways at this point, nobody alive who's ever known you will ever forgive you for what you've done. That Dresden fellow was a fan of yours for a bit, but how did things end with him again? Besides, your abilities will be somewhat lessened without this. He revealed a glowing red sphere of energy above his hand. Rava glanced up, not knowing what she was looking at at first. But then, her eyes darted down to her arms. She choked back a horrified gasp, seeing that her overseer runes were gone. What? What? How, how did you do that? 
It wasn't easy, and to be honest, I wasn't even sure if I was going to be able to take your Overseer energy from you. But we spent so long poking around in your head that I eventually figured it out in the background. He flicked his wrist, and the energy turned into billions of particles, then faded from view. Fear scrambled forward and grabbed his legs desperately. Please, wait, just give it back. I, I need it. Oh, it's too late for that now, kiddo. It's divided up into minuscule little fractions and gone into the body of every soul from your home dimension. No getting it back now. I didn't strip you of all your powers, though. You can still fly and make your little demon tentacles. Still don't need to breathe, it seems. Plus, I'll do you one more favor and drop you off at home. His body glitched and they both appeared over an open ocean, with just a small peak of mountains sticking up out of the water. Oh, that's right, you sunk your old island home. Oh well, it's still something. He grabbed her off his ankles and hurled her down onto the minuscule remaining land. The Archon floated down, swirling his hands, making a knife appear. Now you're likely weak enough that a simple Archonic Blade could end you, but your life or death is inconsequential to us now. You're the only one that has to live with you. Or not. He tossed the knife down to the ground in front of her. It's your choice, kid. Stick around or don't. But I suppose it could be fun to see what you do next. The entertainment of that would at least make you of some value to me. His body glitched again, and he was gone, leaving fear all alone, just her and the blade. She stared at the weapon, panting and shaking. After a moment, she screamed and batted it away into the water, then just curled up in a ball and cried, with the sound of her weeping vanishing into the swell of the open ocean. So, I hadn't planned on giving Fear herself a redemption arc, but after this episode, I kind of want to, because I just feel really bad for her now. But I don't know, we'll see what happens. If you want more episodes of my original characters being traumatized, you might enjoy Dresden Oakland and the death of the SCP Foundation, or maybe The Broken Hero. Or if you want to laugh, I recommend going back to the death of Benny Shark, which I think I'm pretty settled on now is the funniest episode in the history of this channel at the moment. Also know that on Monday I'm going to have some weird releases coming out. I'm going to be releasing three episodes. They're all going to be more story focused and have one drawing each and be part of a series called Vigilance, based on stories that I developed in a podcast I used to do on the Popcraft Studios Patreon, which is free for everyone to listen to now, called the In Another Multiverse Production Journal. Again, they're going to be different format sort of episodes, but I'm really excited about the stories in them. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note, and the thought I want to leave people with today is the idea that if something someone says or someone else does or an event triggers you, whether it triggers you to anger or sadness or some really strong negative emotion, don't jump to immediately trying to avoid that feeling. Feel into it and try to understand why that specific thing triggers you so much. That can be a great moment of self-awareness where you realize why something hurts you so much and you can start healing from it so that it doesn't hurt you again in the same way in the future. I hope that's inspiring. I love you all and I'll see you all in the next episode, episodes on Monday. Goodbye.